everybody, it's Robert Dunt, founder of ArtTop10.com and today I'm at the press view of Falral Nisa Zaid, who as you can see is pretty much predominantly an abstract artist. She had quite an extraordinary life, she lived between 1901 to 1991 and she was born into an elite Ottoman family in Istanbul. Um, more intriguingly, uh, life includes a family murder, marrying into royalty and a narrow escape from political assassination, as you do. Um, she lived in quite a lot of different countries. Um, I seem to enjoy being in Paris most of the time. Anyway, let's have a little snoop through all the different rooms. So the whole thing starts off in this quite dark room and it gives you a good sense of the different places she lived in, New York, London, Paris, Berlin. Istanbul, Oman in Jordan, and Baghdad. Anyway, let's head into the first room. You can see an early self-portrait of Zaid behind me. And she started painting and drawing from quite an early age. And admittedly, I'd never heard of her before. And that is quite possibly, as they said, because she's a female artist and a Muslim artist, so she probably doesn't have an easy time of getting into an art history canon. Um, this first room is quite sort of Matisse, like the one you can see behind me here. And um, I think she had quite a sort of Parisian feel for things for a while. As we head off into this third room, uh, she begins to move towards abstraction, away from well, what I would have called that kind of Matisse representational stuff. Um, there's a picture over here that the uh, creator to a set seemed quite relevant called Bedouin Women. It's got quite a nice sense of her looking, of not her necessarily, but of a Bedouin woman looking out of a sort of birdcage window, which is quite a nice way to see that abstraction coming about. And then if you look around over here, they've got a painting that uh, they said sort of feels like her edging towards abstraction. It's still got a bit of representational stuff in it but it's um, verging on this abstraction thing. And then when you come over here, you begin to see she's gone a bit more abstract. Well, as an artist myself, I find all the descriptions of how she changes are moving quite uneasy making, as I think these things are often more intuitive than uh, the way it's described. There's a lot of description about how she's melding Byzantine and different kind of arts together, but I think it's probably more intuitive rather than a planned thing, although it obviously is, is something nice and easy for um, uh, curators and people to fix onto you to try and describe stuff for people coming to visit the exhibition. She did live quite a rarefied life, this painting here of Loch Lomond. Uh, bizarrely enough, it was the Queen Mother who suggested she went to Loch Lomond. There's, um, at the end of the Second World War, her husband, Prince Zaid al Hussein, was appointed ambassador of the Kingdom of Iraq to the United Kingdom. And they lived in London, and from there she lived in London, and also she rented a studio in Paris. Um, and it was around this time she claimed she began to feel at ease as a painter. Anyway, interesting pic where you can see it is drifting into something abstract. This is the sort of main room of the whole thing, and you got some lovely big abstract painting that she's done in here. This is also where I've told off earlier for drinking a bottle of mineral water. I seem to get told off at almost every exhibition I go to for one reason or another. Um, but this is a good one, isn't it? This is called My Hell, I think, and it's over five meters. Intriguingly enough, she had to sort of pin it around the edge of her studio to paint it, which is quite nice. Um, this is the one they keep talking about, but in reality, I actually prefer this one over here on the other wall, that more red one. Apparently around this time she was exhibiting in a gallery in um, New York that Andy Warhol exhibited in, so she did have quite a presence in the art world within the time she was working in. As an abstract artist myself, I'm always quite interested to see just how these people actually paint the bits on the, on the canvas, how tightly it's painted or loosely. But if you look at it, I don't know if you can see off here, but it's actually quite loosely painted. It's not too uh, neurotic. It's quite 
loose because I've painted some geometric abstraction stuff myself and it's come out very, very tight. But it's interesting if you look at different artists, there's a tightness or a looseness to all of them. It's actually painted quite nicely. You don't feel traumatised with exhaustion while you look at it. Of course, we've got a nice little film of uh, people chatting about her and um, how she lived, which yeah, can be more interesting than might think these films. Um, but it's basically this room that's got all the, the crack and stuff in it. And it is good. It's nice. Nice uh, colours, nice size. Um, quite impressive and encompassing paintings. Um, but good, it's worth seeing. Um, the colours, I mean, they're not bad at all, are they? I wonder if it could do more, but they're, but they're very lookable. Uh, especially those big ones, which are quite impressive. And we'll move on into the next room. In the 1950s, uh, she bought a holiday villa on the island of Isia, and then she began to move away from the strong back lines that she'd done in the other paintings. Bizarrely enough, around this time, her husband returned to Baghdad in the summer to relieve his nephew, King Faisal, of his duties. <laughs> she persuaded him to go to Isia instead, which was lucky as there was a coup d'etat in Iraq, and all the royal family were assassinated. And they were given 24 hours to get out. Uh, anyway, so they made it. Um, I don't actually like these pictures so much. Um, I think these are the ones where she's apparently meant to have been inspired by nature. This is one called London, the firework, which I don't really like much at all. Um, you got this one here, which is a bit sort of amorphous. It doesn't seem to quite have the clarity of the other abstracts in that room back there. They seem a bit, well, I would say vague and inconclusive. Um, I guess that could just be experimentation, but it's not grabbing me like the rest of it. Although this, uh, uh, I guess it's a watercolour over here, and the one on the right hand side, sir, is uh, quite nice. I can't like that one. Bizarrely enough, it was the age of 57 that Zaid cooked a meal for the first time because she'd obviously lived a, a reasonably charmed life as the uh, ambassador and everything cooked for her. Um, slightly more bizarrely, this then inspired her to start change painting her uh, chicken bones, but well, that's proper creativity for you, I guess, make the most of whatever you can find. But, um, Intriguingly moved to Amman in Jordan to be near her son and did actually do these rather interesting um, uh, portrait paintings which are quite interesting and really striking. And they remind me of that French guy whose name I've absolutely forgotten at the moment and he did those pictures of tigers. Particularly like this weird one. And the sky with the red background, got those very strong coloured backgrounds, but like those David Hartley pictures or even Picasso's. The colours in these are actually almost uh, better than the use of colour in the um, abstracts, I'd say. This guy's absolutely bizarre. So he's reading a book on Hegel, and the name is called Rose Rock Granoff, and this was painted in 1971. He seems to be wearing a Fitbit. It's slightly bizarre. So this is a cracking self portrait of herself, which she has called someone from the past, slightly bizarre. But more intriguing is her comment where she says, I'm a descendant of four civilizations in my self-portrait. The hand is Persian, the dress is Byzantine, the face is Cretan and the eyes are Oriental. But I'm not aware of this at the time as I was painting it. So, that kind of upholds my theory that there's a lot of discussion about, um, oh, you know, people like to set this thing in it being a Byzantine or um, different slant on all her paintings but for her that may not be something she's consciously thinking about the whole time it's more unconsciously feeding into what she produces anyway that's the uh, exhibition you can still see the big paintings behind 
uh, that's the first Art Top 10 video review. I'm going to do a few more of these. I might try to sound slightly less self-conscious next time when I've worked out how well the microphone's working. And um, if I'm not tired off, I'm drinking water and the thing as usual. Anyway, I'll try and film a telling off next time and we can put a montage of telling off stories together. But um, anyway, it's pretty cool. Worth seeing. Lots of nice big paintings. Um, fascinating life as well of all the different places she lived and the uh, ambassadorial duty she was akin to. Um, does make you think how hard it is to succeed as a painter without that sort of backing and money and time because without it it is very very hard as a lot of people know um, but paintings are still good whatever so hang in there and uh, I'll see you soon for the next Art Top 10 review and as ever as everybody likes on YouTube do uh, like us subscribe to the channel and yeah so this is the founder of Art Top 10, Robert Dump, saying cheerio. And uh, you can see my own paintings on the uh, website link at the top. Okay, cheerio, guys. Bye, bye, bye.